Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. So today we're gonna to be picking up from where I left off last day. So last day I introduced the idea of a model of computation and I talked about how there's sort of these issues we ran into when we try to analyze an algorithm. So for example, if I give you one implementation of an algorithm on a very specific computer and I time that, are there any drawbacks to this approach? <coughs> and, sorry, my apologies. And the answer of course was yes, because what if I take that same algorithm, implement it in a different programming language, or use even a different compiler or a different computer? Am I even comparing the same algorithm again? And naturally, the answer is it becomes machine dependent. So one natural thing for us is figuring out how we can study the efficiency of an algorithm so we can compare two different algorithms, not necessarily their implementations. So last day we talked a bit about um, a lot of these bits and pieces. I thought we would return back to linear search. <coughs> My apologies. The, um, to figure out how we can use the counting rules that we talked about last day for the random access machine model. So just as a quick reminder, remember simple or primitive operations, which includes things like arithmetic, basic logic operations, comparisons, equality, not equals, all of these, including basic control structure, just performing it once, um, as long as it's some constant number of operations that are happening for that condition. We can count these all as simple or primitive operations, but things like loops are not simple operations. Uh, and also, of course, with our model, we are allowed to have as much memory as we would like. So we're going to be putting these into practice and see what happens. So we're going to do worst case analysis for linear search. Now, we talked last day about how we might determine worst case analysis or the, in our case, worst case scenario for linear search. Does anybody remember? What we talked about as the worst case scenario for linear search, could somebody tell me? Because remember, the whole idea is that we want to determine the complexity of the algorithm. Worst case analysis is natural for us to study because it tells us how long the algorithm will take for a given input size n. Yes, exactly, when x is not in the array. Right, exactly. So it's when x is not in array L. The reason why we would say this, this as a reminder, is I would like to make it so that the algorithm takes as long as possible to execute. So one natural way to do that is identify instances, which this is what we do with worst case analysis, we identify a scenario that defines a set of instances for a given size input that causes the algorithm to perform the most number of operations possible, or at least something akin to this. So notice that if I have that scenario, the thing I want you to pay attention to is that I first assign i to be zero, then I do this while loop, but if x isn't in the array, notice that it's never going to invalidate this condition, Instead, it's going to have validate this one when it exits out of the loop. So this is going to play a very big role in how we actually perform the analysis. So to do this, we're going to start off by just trying to count the total number of operations that happen. So I'm hoping to give you some intuitions behind what I mean by a constant number of operations. So let's look at, so what I've done is I've labeled each one of the lines here. I have five lines I've labeled here. And what I would like to do is determine how many times it happens and the total amount of time. Now remember, the time is dictated by the model. So for example, a simple or primitive operation takes some constant time to perform. So you can think of time as a measurement of the number of operations. So line number one, can somebody tell me how many times does line one occur? How many times does that happen? Well, I'm just asking how many times it happens. Just once, just once, right? I just, I just assign i to be zero and then I proceed to line two, right? So it just happens once. And to do this is just some, sim it's a simple or primitive operation because it's just an assignment, right? So I'm going to tell you, I'm just gonna define this operation because I know, okay, 
The assignment had, I've, I know that the assignment takes some constant number of operations. I'm going to give that a name. The constant I'm going to use is I'm going to call it C1. Now, this isn't, this isn't a special name or anything like that. The point is, is it's a variable that represents that constant number of operations. Now, if we look at, notice that lines four and five also have a very similar type of thing going on with them. In fact, technically speaking, I'm also, also technically performing an upper bound on the number of operations if I count all of them, because for example, when X isn't in the array, it actually executes four, but it doesn't execute five. Does everybody see that? So I'm just going to just be generous and I'm also gonna include line five in here too. Like I said, I'm just gonna count all the operations. Including at a constant like that doesn't do anything to us. So notice that in these cases, both of these happen at most once. So it happens at most once. So for each one of those respectively, I can say, okay, that's some constant number of operations. This is also a constant number of operations. I'll call those constants C4 and C5. Now, two and three, that, that seems to be where things are getting interesting, right? So let's take a look at this carefully. Now, I wanna remind you how a while loop works. So first, when I enter the while loop, I check its conditions and if they're satisfied, I execute the block of code for that while loop, right? So when I exit out of a while loop, I have to do so when the condition is no longer satisfied. But that requires me to actually check the condition, right? So this is one thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we look at this. So now remember, in linear search, the whole idea here is that since X isn't in the array, It'll examine the first spot. It doesn't find it there. Goes to the next spot. Doesn't find it there, right? It does this for every single one of the positions and then it'll exit out of the while loop. But the thing is there are how many elements in the array? There's N of them, right? So the first thing you might notice very quickly is that, okay, well line three, if I count up line three, cause that is indeed one that is always satisfied when those conditions are, and that's just when I'm going across the array, right? So you know right away that the number of times that happens has to be N. So I'm just gonna give that a name, I'll call it C3 times N because each of these assignments, so when I assign I to be I plus one, or you can think of this just as I plus plus, if you wanna write it like that, uh, it's just a subconstant number of operations times how many times it happens, right? But line, uh, line two, line two I want to be a bit more careful about, is notice that here, it indeed will perform at least n operations in the worst case. But notice that there's actually one last, it, one last check that happens on the while loop, right? It's when we check i is less than n. So notice that if i is no longer less than n, then you exit out of the while loop, right? But I have to perform this check if I explicitly count line two. But that means there's one extra check that happens. So notice the number of times line two explicitly happens is n plus one. It's one extra one for the additional check at the end. So it would just be C2 times n plus one. So does anybody see how I could de determine the total amount of time or the total number of operations for linear search? Does anybody have any ideas how I can use this table? Any ideas at all? Why is line four N? Um, sorry, this is written a little bit lower. It should be just slightly higher. It's line three. So notice it's like this. <laughs> so what should I do with this table? So if I want to determine the total number of operations, yes, yeah, sum up this column, right? So all I do is I just, I could determine a complexity function by just taking all of these total times. Exactly, exactly. So I can write the complexity function now. So the total number of operations, I could give this by a sum like this, but here's the thing I want to point out to you that's very fascinating. 
just to give you some intuition about these constants. Now remember, in the model, that's what we dictated, is that it's some constant number of operations. An intuition for you, if you'd like, is you can think of C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 as the actual number of CPU cycles for a given computer. So for one given implementation of the algorithm, you can think of these constants as CPU cycles. Now, I don't know what those are. The whole point is I don't want to incorporate that because that's a machine dependent approach. So you're gonna see very quickly that when I do this, I'm gonna be more interested in what happens with respect to the input size. But you can think of these constants just like CPU cycles. I'm just measuring those. Now, another intuition for this that makes it a little bit easier to see is if you were to measure this, instead of by line, you measure it by how many times a given operation occurs. That, I think, the intuition matches more naturally. But regardless, it's a helpful way of looking at these constants. So, so keep in mind, C1 through C5, they can vary from computer to computer. So, so the total running time is, so I'm just going to take C1 plus C2 times n plus 1 plus C3 times n plus C4 plus C5. Now, I'm going to simplify this a little further just so you can see something rather fascinating about the form of this complexity function. Because keep in mind that this is in fact a complexity function I've just described to you. I haven't given it a name as a function or anything like that. I just want to keep things simple at this stage. So I'm just going to factor out a couple of things here just to make it a little easier to see the form of this function. So notice I have C2 and C3 have an N involved in it. So I'm going to factor C2 and C3 together. So it'll be C2 times, sorry, C2 plus C3 times N. Plus I'm going to pull out one of those terms for the C2 there. So plus C1 plus C2 plus C4 plus C5. So now I have C2 plus C3 together times N plus C1 plus C2 plus C4 plus C5. Now I have a question for you. What kind of function did I just write out here? There's a name I'm looking for. So what kind of function is that? Starts with an L. Linear, exactly, exactly. This is a linear function. So notice this is a, this is a linear function. And this should match your intuition with linear search, right? that the running time should depend on the length of the array in the worst case, right? So notice that the length of the array is right there. It's right there. And that's what we were considering as the input size. So there it is, right there. So what we would say is that linear search runs in linear time in the worst case. This function I described to you is linear. It's linear in the input size. So are there any questions about what we did here? Any questions at all? So this is one way you can analyze in the worst case, the time complexity is you, you literally can count up all the operations like this. I must stress that I will be doing things a little bit more smoothly. Uh, you don't have to most certainly do this. I'm going to most certainly show you some shorter ways to do this, but as you make it much more sophisticated with the way you're doing it, you also have to be careful with the way you explain it. But the big thing I really want to point out to you is the biggest part that really mattered to us, it seems, is really these two lines. Does everybody see that? Lines two and three really were the ones that drive this thing to be a linear function, which is exactly what you would expect because those, those two lines are the ones involving the while loop. So, as we study more algorithms and study time complexity, you're going to see that by identifying these parts of the algorithms, the algorithm were which, if I look at my algorithm, sorry, I have to rephrase this. I look at my algorithm. I try to identify the operations that happen more often than any other operations in the algorithm. This is intuitively one way you can find a quick way of computing the time complexity.
So notice that lines two and three, if the minute that you notice that I can just count up how many times line three happens, well, what's line three? It's C3 times N, right? Boom, there's a linear function right there. Now, most certainly, um, you might argue that, oh yeah, if this is supposed to represent the true time, most certainly I'm omitting lines like this. You might say, Dan, well, you're cutting corners. But you're gonna see at the end of the day, if I'm interested in the time complexity of the algorithm, for all possible inputs, I'm gonna come up with a very natural way to write this out, that we really care much more about how the complexity relates to the input size. It's not so much about these constants. These constants actually end up not being, they mostly end up being noise in terms of how we're going to measure these things. But if you ever need to get very delicate with your analysis, this is a very useful way to carry it out. So I'll be showing you ways to refine this analysis approach. So right now I just thought, well, let's try it with the table where we go through all the lines. So just to summarize, just to summarize, the wor I would tell you that the worst case running time of linear search is linear. So that's the big thing I really want you to notice is that we actually derived it ourselves is that we've seen, oh, it takes, it's, if in our model, it takes linear time in the worst case. So normally the way I would phrase this is that the worst case running time or the worst case time complexity is linear. Now, as I mentioned uh, the other day, is that, I know I was talking to some students about this, is that you of course can measure and count the lines, right? How many times these happen? And then you would introduce constants for each one in the most literal way. But you can also do the same exercise with by counting the operations too. So for example, if I wanted to measure how many times assignments happen, for example, there's one right here, there's n, ass n assignments that happen in here. Um, you can count up all of the operations by type. Instead, you also will end up with a linear function too, which is also fascinating. So I must stress that this isn't just simply an artifact of counting lines. This is out about us counting the operations. So I included a little table in the notes if you're curious about this. Most certainly you don't have to do it that way at all. I just want to show it as a little intellectual exercise if you really just want to be like sure that we're not missing anything by doing it this way. So anyways, I wanted to kind of shift gears to talk about how we could take the analysis we did for linear search here and simplify that approach. You're going to see that we actually did a lot more work than we actually needed to. We had a lot of constants, right? We had five constants, one for each line. So just to illustrate my point, when I have each one of my lines, I might say that that's some constant number of operations. So suppose that this represents some constant number of operations. So that's, that's some constant number of operations right there. Now, if I do two constant numbers of operations, right? Say this is another constant number of operations. They're inside of this little capsule here. And say if I do another one. But suppose that only three ever happen. Would you agree with me that if each one of these has a constant number of operations that occur, that, and if there's a constant number of them, that that should total to a constant number of operations in total, right? So. That's the first thing we could do to refine our analysis so we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of counting every single line. We could start thinking about our operations as groups of operations that we can count. So we're gonna see very quickly how we could speed up the process that we just did over there by noticing and grouping these constant numbers of operations and seeing how many times they occur. So instead of, for example, literally counting line two, I'll be interested in how many times line three happens with respect to two. Because notice that line three is some constant number of operations, right? Same idea with one, notice that lines one, four, and five, and this also happened in our table, right? These were all constant numbers of operations because each one happened once, right? So the idea, what we're going to do is we're going to group these constant numbers of operations by how many times they happen. And you're gonna see that this actually speeds up this process. We're gonna still end up with a linear function. So notice that the goal that we've gone to is that as long as we get a linear function in our analysis, and we've indeed counted the parts that actually matter the most when we measure the input size with respect to it, 
we're okay. We're okay. So, so just as an example, let's take a look again at linear search here. So I have linear search over here. You can see I still have my lines here. So I got my lines. I got one, two, three, four, five. Now I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that really, there's really kind of two parts to this that really we should really care about much here. So I want you to notice that we have line one, we have lines four and five, as I mentioned. These, this takes a constant time, this takes constant time, this takes constant time, right? So what makes it special to call each one of these their, their own constant, right? I could just group them all together because they all happen once. So I could take all of these, I could group them together and say, okay, that is, say, uh, we'll call it, I'm just trying to think, we want to call it C1 or C2. Let's call it C2, because I'd rather focus more on the stuff inside the loop. So there's C2 many operations that happen outside the while loop. Does everybody see that? So there's C2 many operations that happen there. So outside the while loop, we've accounted for those as C2 many operations. So that's just the name I've given those constant number of operations. So C too many there. Then if we focus on lines two and three. Notice that in the worst case, we really care about how many times three occurs, right? But if C line three takes C1 many operations to happen, what we have to do is determine how many times this while loop iterates with C, sorry, with uh, how many times C1 occurs. So it's really just the number of iterations times C1. And then we could reformulate the complexity function this way. So let me just put this all together for us. So for example, notice that line three takes some constant number, some constant, C1 operations and lines one, four, and five take some constant C2 operations. So remind me again, how many iterations of the while loop occur such that line three occurs? How many? So how many times does line three happen? It's N, it's N. So I'm not explicitly counting line two, I'm counting line three. So, cause remember line three is the focus here. Now keep in mind that like I said, if there's that extra iteration, it's just some other constant, right? It's just, it's not really adding anything by incorporating that extra one in this case. So notice that if I actually were to count up how many operations happened here, I'll end up with something like n times c1, right? Now keep in mind, like I said, if you want to be like, okay, I want to bound it even further, you could be more generous with your analysis and you could go, okay, well, notice that this while loop with this line in total well, it has to do these conditional checks too, so you can always add one extra loop iteration if you'd like, but we don't, most, we don't necessarily need that, right? Remember, the focus here is as long as we include all the operations, but also, also as long as we address that loop, we're okay. But the point is that loop performs some linear number of operations. That's what we know. So, sorry, the number, so when I, so just to be very clear, we're going to focus on the number of iterations of the loop, not how many times line two specifically occurs, which these are actually two different things. For example, notice that this is a conditional check on that last one here. It's just some constant number of operations that happens. It may as well just be grouped with everything else I counted outside the loop. Um, but notice that really we want to know how many times line three occurs. And then we know that that happens n times. That's what I mean by number of iterations, is how many times does the block of code inside the while loop occur? But notice the main reason why we can get away with this is because 
The while loop itself, its conditions, there's a constant amount of time that takes place here for the conditional check. That's why it, it really doesn't matter. If that while loop tested a subroutine, like I called it other function, then we'd have to look at that more carefully. So, the number of iterations of the while loop is n in the worst case, in the worst case. Thus, thus, the worst case time complexity, the worst case time complexity Time complexity is, I'm just going to sum over these two. So I just take C2, so I have C2 plus C1 times N. So notice that I still get what kind of function, everybody? What kind of function is that down there? It's a linear function, exactly, exactly. It's just a linear function. So notice that if you actually look carefully at what I did actually over here in our table, all I've done is I've truncated things. Because remember, at the end of the day, when I simplified down this complexity function, do you notice that I had C2 plus C3 times N plus a whole bunch of constants? Notice that, look, there's a bunch of constants, then I have another constant times N. It has the exact same form. Does everybody see that? It has the exact same form. That's rather fascinating, right? So notice that I have cut a lot of corners, but I got the same outcome. Just these, they're just different names for the constants. So there any questions about how I went about this? So remember, all I'm doing is I'm just, rather than counting, giving a name to each one of the constants, I just group them. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> So I'll be doing another example of this just to really give you an idea of what I mean by this. So the main thing we'll focus on is trying to identify constant numbers of operations and we'll figure out how many times these occur. For example, if I have a while loop, I want to know how many times the while loop occurs. If I have a nested for loop, I want to know how many times the in innermost loop occurs and then how many times does that occur in the outermost loop. Uh, sure. I'll clarify. So C1, so remember C1 is this line right here. It's the amount of operations it takes for me to perform this assignment. How many times does that happen? It happens exactly n times in the worst case. Then every other operation I have here, all of these take some constant number of operations, so that's C2. So that's actually where C1 and C2 come from. And all I'm doing to count up all the operations, I just typically sum them together like this. Now, anytime, anytime. Yeah, don't worry, this won't be the only example you'll see. We'll be doing another one. So, that being said, I want to show you a couple of handy things that we're going to use in our analysis very often in this class. So, I thought that we might play around a little bit with some something called a closed form. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the idea of a closed form expression? You may know it as just a simple formula. Say, for example, if you have a summation, may have a simple formula for calculating, in terms of some constant number of operations, the outcome. Uh, so it's just a very basic formula for something like a sum or basic or finite series. You may have even seen some of these kind of formulas for infinite series before. But the point is, is that we'll see a couple that are going to very often occur in our analysis. So I thought we'll play a little bit around with this and find out how we can use them because we're going to use them in our next example. So I'm going to keep linear search over there because because we might actually I don't think we're I think we might not need linear search anymore. Yeah, I think we're all good. Let's get rid of linear search. Just wanted to make sure. So one thing I do want to mention is that you can always look at what we got over here. So notice that I had C2 plus C1 times N, right, that we had earlier. <laughs> 
Notice that really all it really, the exercise really was, I count up the number of primitive or simple operations on the lines that happen the most. And if you do the same exercise again, you'll notice that you just end up with n as opposed to just a bunch of constants. You'll see that really doing it that way doesn't really take away anything when we get to our endpoint, which is going to be talking about these with respect to all inputs and all possible implementations where those constants actually would matter for any for a single machine. But most certainly we focus more on what happens regardless of that. So let's talk about some couple handy closed forms. So note that in the document I have on the course website, uh, there's a it's a, a basic document on math on uh, some mathematics for algorithm analysis. I include a much more extensive list. I encourage you to take a peek at it. The only two that I'll require you to know about on anything like an exam or something like that, but the other ones you might use, for example, on an assignment or something like that. But these two are the specific ones you're going to run into very often. So I wanted to talk a little bit about these. So commonly, when counting operations, we will encounter, we will encounter, we will encounter frequently certain counts, certain counts based on the control structures structures of the algorithms. So there's going to be two that you're going to run into, I almost guarantee you, almost all the time. Identifying their form makes your analysis go a lot smoother. So I'll start, I have two of them listed. I'm going to start off with the easier of the two. So I'll start off with number two in the notes that I have on online. But I'll label it as, okay, I'll label number two here first, just for the sake of consistency. I apologize for those that are really obsessed with making sure their lists start at one or even zero. Uh, I'll start at two because that's what I have in my notes online. So, so I'm going to start off by, if we assume we have A and B that are, um, that are, are, are non-negative integers. And we have a constant C, which is a real number. So this blackboard R means the set of all real numbers. So this is just saying that this is something like, for example, you may know floating point numbers. This could be a number like pi. It could be, for example, well, in that case, it's literally a real number, but um, but I mean something as long lines of like 1.5, 2.5, heck even the number 4, these are all real numbers. Square root of 2, there's another real number. Um, so C is going to be in here too, and I'm going to presume that A is less than or equal to B. So I'm going to have these two values and that constant C. Then. Then I'm going to have the sum from i is equal to a to b. I'll explain this notation if you've never seen it before. You may have before. So this is what we call sigma notation. Uh, this is often used to write down a sum uh, with a sequence with terms. What is described right here is often referred to as the summand. And these are the that's the lower limit and the upper limit, or upper, lower bound, upper bound. So what this is saying is that we start off at value a for i. Just You think of it just like a loop. You know how we have an initial value for the loop where you have like int i is assigned 0, for example. In this case, like you can think of i being assigned uh, a instead. And it goes up to and includes the value b. And what happens is if i is appears anywhere in the summand, 
then we replace i's value with that current value. So for example here, notice that I have, I have a and b here. So just to give you a quick example of what I mean by this, suppose that a was equal to 1 and b was equal to 5. So what this is saying is that I have to sum from i is equal to 1 to 5 of c. So what would that be? Well, I would start off with i is equal to 1. So I'd write c plus, okay, now i is going to be equal to 2. I write c. When i is equal to 3, I add c. When i is equal to 4, I add c. When i is equal to 5, I add c. So notice that all it is is just repeatedly summing, but sometimes the sum in depends on the variable i. We're going to see this with our other closed form. So here's the neat thing about this one right here. Notice that it's actually just repeatedly summing over all of these terms, but notice it's the same thing inside this as a sum in each time. So for example, if I had a bunch of terms and each one of them is just the same value being added over and over again, this is no different than me expressing how many times I add this specific number times the number itself that's the sum in. And that's the first one I want to describe to you. So another way I can rewrite this sum is by taking and saying c times b minus a plus 1. You might ask where the plus 1 comes from. It's actually because I'm counting how many times we actually count up c. So notice that when I start off at 1, notice that I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Notice if I took 5 and subtracted 1, I would get 4, right? I would miss 1. That's why I'm adding 1 in. Because when I start off at i is equal to a, I have to include the first instance I start adding. So this is the first closed form expression I want you to be aware of. Very often you'll run into it where this c here ends up being a constant like we've been playing around with, or it might even be a 1, or it might be, for example, something that doesn't actually depend on i. For example, it might be, might be n. Uh, in that case, you'll notice that I could just rewrite this, if this was c was an n, for example, I could rewrite this as n times whatever b is minus a plus 1. So I want to focus primary, actually first, are there any questions about this particular closed form? We're going to run into it very often, but really, it looks a lot more sophisticated than it actually is. All I'm saying is, for example, if I'm adding 2 four times, that's no different than me writing 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. So notice that it's the same thing I did over here. The sum is just that literally. And I'm just saying, okay, you just add, you add, it, you add it four times, right? The same, it's the same idea. It's just a very basic counting rule. The first one I want to focus on primarily is the following. It actually has a very special name. So it's going to be the sum as i is equal to 1 to n of i. But notice that now inside as a sum end, I have, a, I have an i. It's not, it's not a constant anymore. Notice that now it varies as i changes. Just like if you had a for loop, and inside the for loop, the, I, the value of i might play a big role in how the algorithm behaves. The same idea here. If you're wondering what this represents, all it is is it starts off at 1 and it goes up to n and it sums from 1 up to n. So if you were to carry this out just like I did here, it would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. So this is what the, this is the sum that you're going to get from this series. So the formula I want you to be aware of is that if I have this upper limit here as n, then you end up with n times n plus 1 over 2. Now, if, now, I have a bit of a question for you. Some of you may know what this series is called. Does anybody know what this series is called? It has a special name. It starts with an A. This one is one we'll run into a lot. It's on an alternating series. I do like that somebody brought up an alternating series. I, it's, it's always fascinating to me, but um, it's not an alternating series. Arithmetic, very good. It's an arithmetic series. Very good, arithmetic series. So this is known as the arithmetic series. So this one we'll run into a lot. 
if you're meddling around with a nested loop. So we're going to see that actually in our example that when we have a nested loop, we're going to run into this, this guy over here. We're going to actually see both of them in practice. But I, you might ask, Dan, where does this come from? Like, how did you get this? <laughs> now, there's many ways you can derive this. Uh, there's a lot of, there's many, many different proofs for it. I thought I would show you an intuition behind it that's a little bit more geometric. So I'm going to give you a, one way you could think about what I have over here. So for those that have never seen this idea before, I want to show you why and an easy way to remember that this is in fact the closed form formula or closed form expression for this series. So let's first, I'm first going to write and represent these as boxes. So for example, I have one box for one. I have two boxes for two. I have three boxes for three. And if obviously my goal is if I get up to an N eventually, I want to know how many boxes there are. So eventually I will get to some point where I will have, I'll have N boxes. So notice I have one plus two plus three all the way up, right? All the way up to N. Now, I would like to know how many boxes there are. Now I'm going to use a little trick that you might know about area. Uh, so notice here that at first it might be a little bit unclear how to exactly do you compute. If you think of these as one by one squares, and I want to compute the total area of all these boxes, if you think of it geometrically. Now, it might not be clear how to do this at first, but I'll show you a very cute trick you can do. So watch this, watch this. So for every one of the boxes here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a complementary box that kind of mirrors it. So for example, when I have n here, I'm going to introduce a box here. For the next one it, on its in the next spot over, I'll have two boxes to match up the n minus one boxes here. And then I'll have three boxes for n minus two many, and so on. And I'll keep doing this. I'm going to keep filling in all these squares until I end up with a rectangle. So I'm essentially going to be forming a rectangle where I'm going to take everything I had for the boxes. I'm going to mirror it over here. And that's what the green boxes are. So you might ask, okay, what's the area of this rectangle? So the first thing I could tell you is that this dimension, I made it one higher, right? So you know that th that dimension is n plus one. What about this dimension? What's the dimension on this side? If you think of it as one big rectangle, it's n, exactly. So. If you think back to your elementary school days, computing the area exactly, it's n times n plus 1. But do you remember how I constructed all these green rectangles, right? I took a mirror image of the black boxes. I just took them and I flipped it over like this. So do you see what, where I'm going with this? So you know the total area of it is n times n plus 1. So if I want half of that area, that should represent the total area of all my boxes, the black ones specifically. But what is that? Well, that's the number of boxes there are. But what is that? That's the sum of one through n, right? Like this. And that's exactly where it comes from. So it's exact, it's half the area of this rectangle. That's, I find that's a very easy way to remember this form. So it's just half the area of that rectangle and the dimensions of it are n times n plus one. So are there any questions about that? I thought I would show you this because I know that usually the first time I show it to some students are just like, wow, that's really clever. <laughs> I didn't come up with this. This is a very cute uh, counting trick. Uh, but most certainly, I, hopefully you found it interesting. So I think that sometimes it's an easy way to remember how to do it. It's just, if you remember how you can compute the area of this rectangle, you can know very quickly how, what that formula should look like. So this is the arithmetic series. This is the what we call the closed form expression.
for the Earthmatic series. So we're going to be using this in our example. So I thought we would get to our example. So are there any questions about these two right here before we proceed? Because we're going to use both of them. So give me two thumbs up if we're all good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I thought the perfect example for us to do is to play around with insertion sort, because I know you've seen insertion sort before, but insertion sort is a little bit more complicated than linear search was. So why don't we play around with insertion sort and see what we can get from there. So let's talk about insertion sort. So I'm going to give you a quick reminder of what insertion sort is, but I'll be relying a lot on your understanding of that algorithm. So I'll be just giving you a high level about it. But the big message here, the big thing is that we need to know a little bit about the algorithm to figure out what the worst case analysis is. But most certainly, at the end of the day, it's just counting operations. So once you figure that out, it's rather oblivious to the inner workings of the algorithm. So that's the other big thing I want you to take away from this. So it's really a bit of both. It's, you have to know a bit about the algorithm to analyze it, most certainly. Especially when you start dealing with much more specialized algorithms, that plays a very key role in the analysis. But most certainly, once you know what the worst case situation is, and you have a description of the algorithm, you just have to count the operations. But that, you don't need to get too overly crazy with. So, we're going to do talk about uh, computing the time complexity of insertion sort. So let's talk about the time complexity of insertion sort. So I'm going to remind you what insertion sort is, so I'll write out what insertion sort is in a moment. Let me just get a different marker. This one seems to be somewhat questionable. So I just want to remind you a bit about what insertion sort does. So remember, we're considering the sorting problem, so I'm given n elements. I would like to sort them from smallest to largest, assuming that I can compare them uh, so that I know which one comes before the other ones. So remember, in insertion sort, what I do is I partially sort the array by scanning from left to right in the array. And for each one of the positions, I shuffle over any elements to my left that are already sorted to fit it into the appropriate spot. Hence why we call it insertion sort. I insert it into the appropriate spot each time. So the reason why this works is because every single time I ensure I'm maintaining a partially sorted set of elements in the array. So every time I can introduce another element, I toss that element inside of my partially sorted, give it as a list of elements. So I incorporate that in into the spot where it fits. So this is how I ensure insertion sort always works is it just repeatedly does this over and over again until I consider all the elements. And by definition, instead of it just being a partially sorted list or a partially sorted array, to be more technically correct, it is actually just a sorted array at the end of the process because I've considered every element in the array. So I'm going to write down the pseudocode here for that I'm going to present for insertion sort. I'm going to write it over here. So let me just do that. You're going to find I'm going to go a little faster than we did for our first example. But there's a couple things we really got to be careful about with insertion sort. So I'm going to first give the pseudocode, and then we'll start talking about the worst case analysis here, OK? That's going to be the game plan. So it may not necessarily be presented to you like this always, but most certainly this is one way I can do it. So I'm going to give you the algorithm. Insertion sort. Insertion sort is going to take an array A. It's going to be of length N. It's input. So remember, I like to describe what the input and the output are. Now, in our case, I'm going to return the array. But most certainly, you'll find with a lot of versions of the sorting problem, the goal is just to simply sort the array. I'm just doing this for the sake of showing you a variety of different ways I can write out an algorithm. 
So an array A of size n as input, as output, we're going to have A sorted in non-decreasing order. In non-decreasing order. So A sorted in non-decreasing order. So that's what I'm going to return to you. So I'm going to go through each one of these steps here. So I'm going to present it as a combination of a for loop with a while loop. So I'm going to take these two things together. Uh, but I must stress that there are ways to rewrite this in several other manners. So I'm just going to show you this way. So I'm going to start off with a for loop. So you'll find when I write for loops, I start off with what the variable, for the counter variable is for the for loop. I'll tell you what its initial value is. So I'll tell you, oh, i is assigned 1. That's its initial value. It's up to, but includes this final value, which is going to be n minus 1, which happens to be the posi last position in the array. I'm going to skip over the first one because we'll incorporate that. Well, remember, when I have an array of length 1, the first spot, by definition, if I only have an array of length 1, is already sorted. So all I'm going to do is if I have another position after it, I'll know I have to potentially perform a swap. But we'll see what I mean here. So I'm going to go start from i is equal to 1 up to, but includes, n minus 1. So this is the typical structure you have with a for loop where you have for int i is assigned 1, i is less than or equal to n minus 1, i plus plus. This is how I would write that. Notice that there's not a lot of extra details, but you're welcome to write it in that way if you wish. Just remember, don't forget to use the appropriate symbol for assignment if you are doing it in that manner with this arrow, for example. Now next, I'm going to assign x to be a sub i. And I'm going to make a variable j. I'm going to assign that to be i minus 1. And I'm going to have a while loop. And this is the while loop that's going to perform these appropriate shuffles. That's going to move elements to the right of the element I'm currently considering to put it into its appropriate spot. That's what this while loop's job is. So while j is greater or equal to 0. And a sub j is greater than x, we're going to do the following. So I'm sort of running out of space here. I have do curly brace. So I'm going to have an open curly brace. And I'm going to have the next two lines. I'm going to perform the swap. a sub j plus 1 is going to be signed a sub j. And I'm going to decrement j j is going to be assigned j minus 1. And that ends the while loop. And then lastly, I need to update where x is supposed to go. So I'm just going to just sign a, a sub j plus 1. Sorry, j plus 1 is going to be assigned x. And then we end the for loop, and then we just return a at the end. My apologies, that r is sort of melting in the microwave over there. So it's just returning a after the for loop. So this is one way you can write out insertion sort. So are there any questions about insertion sort itself before we proceed? Uh, I'm hoping I gave you a nice little reminder of how it works. So just remember, each time I start, I go from left to right, I incorporate another element, and I try to find where it fits in everything to its left. So this is done by shuffling over elements to the right, so that I can put x in the right spot. And this, well, I guess x in our case is this one. I'm referring to the current element we're considering, which is x. Uh, if i is if i is equal to one, so j would do, 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 would uh, j is assigned i minus one would be zero. Yeah. Yes. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So it will start off with i being assigned one, and then it will assign j to be zero. 
So this is how you know right away what I've just described previously, is that we're starting off in the next spot over, so in just in case we have to perform a swap with the first spot, that's why you'll notice that if that happens, I decrement J. No, wonderful. But keep in mind, this is just one way you can write insertion sort. There's several other ways to do so. I just wrote it this way just because you may or may not have seen it written that way. Um, I just like to make sure you see a bunch of different ways you could do the same thing. Um, so, let's kind of go through this exercise we just did earlier with insertion, uh, sorry, with linear search. So let's start off with the, well, first question, reminder, what would be a reasonable consideration for the input size here? We talked about this in a previous lecture. For the sorting problem, what would it be? Well, what's one one that we could consider? It would just be N, right? Yeah, exactly, it's just N. So, just keep that in mind when we want to measure the complexity here, we're going to be caring much more about the length of the array here, because that's the input size. So, let's consider the worst case scenario first, because that is, what we're aiming for when we do worst case analysis. So, does anybody remember what, what case might cause insertion sort to perform the most number of operations? I'll give you a bit of a tip. You know that regardless of whatever happens, this for loop is happening, right? There's nothing that causes it to break out of this loop. The thing that of interest is this while loop here. If we can make this happen as many times as possible for a given iteration, then you're good. But there's a very specific set of instances that always cause that to happen. It's actually one of the drawbacks of insertion sort. So there's a, there, there are certain kinds of inputs. If you fed it to insertion sort, it will cause the most number of operations possible for a given size n. So are there any ideas? So remember, we want to maximize the number of operations for the innermost loop. Ah, so somebody is suggesting the initial array is in non-increasing order. So I'll give you a simpler way of rephrasing this. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I'll rephrase it in a different way. We'll consider when A is in reverse sorted order. So for example, if I need it from smallest to largest when I sort it, if I'm giving it largest to smallest, that's going to be a problem because notice that if that occurs, each time I incorporate another element, it's going to get shuffled as far possible to the left as it could go. So, Let's go through this exercise now that we have this. Now, one thing we have to be a bit careful about is that there are a lot more details here than there was in that other example we had. So the first thing I want to do is kind of give us some setup here. So I'm going to start doing the same exercise I did before, where I'm going to start identifying constants and group those together. So this time I'll do it in red, just because that, I don't know, I think that kind of, it's kind of fun. So anyways, Let's go through this exercise. So, of course, let's start off with, uh, well, look look at everything. I have a whole bunch of stuff inside the for loop, right? I have this, and I have this after the while loop, right? I'm gonna group all of these together, these three lines together. Notice that all of these perform some constant number of operations. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's call it C2 because I might want to use C1 for the innermost stuff. So that's C2 many operations that are happening there in total. Next, I have what's happening inside the while loop here. Most certainly this together, I'm going to call that C1. That's how many operations are happening there. Remember that it's some constant number of operations. All, we, all that really matters here is just some constant. I don't know exactly what it is. But when I take the loop in combination with what's happening with C1, well, what's this? This, this is, 
when I take this whole loop with C1, it's going to be C1 times the number of iterations. My apologies for my writing here. It's C1 times the number of iterations. I'll derive this again over on this board over here shortly. I'm just doing some rough work with you. For example, if you wanted to do this on the assignment, that's perfectly fine. If you want to show me how you'd group these, then you describe a couple sentences summarizing how you group them. You'll see that I have some examples of doing this in the notes. Uh, that's one way you can do it. You could also do it with a table. There's some other ways too. Uh, so, what else do I have here? So I have the while loops accounted for. I have these operations accounted for. Um, let's see here. I need to still do... Uh, I think I still need this return statement. The return statement is some, is some C3 many operations. Then I have the for loop, right? I have this for loop. So I have the for loop that's all of this plus that. I'm going to write this all over on this board over here because it's starting to get a little bit harder for me to kind of jot it all together there. So I must stress that normally what you do is you try to summarize what we just did here. What I said verbally, you just write in a couple sentences uh, just to summarize how you group them. So you can say, oh, lines, uh, this line, this line together, the performs a constant C1, many operations and so on. You'll see in the examples that I give, I give full explanations these will be very helpful, for, especially for working on the assignment. Okay, so if I take these all together, so notice that it is all of this, which is the number of iterations of this for loop, times whatever's happening inside this loop, right? So what's happening inside the loop? Well, we have C1 times the number of iterations of the iterations of the while loop right? So it's the number of iterations of the while loop. So that's, it's interesting. And then we have C2 many operations that are all the operations that are just outside the while loop, but are inside the for loop. And then we multiply this by the number of iterations of the for loop. For loop. And then I have C3 just sitting out there that return statement. So notice that this is my complex. This is how I could group all those operations for my complexity function. And now the game becomes how I fill everything in. So So this is the at most, so just to summarize at most the number of operations is this. Then, now what we need to do is we need to start looking at how many iterations happen for that while loop in combination with the for loop. So observe in the worst case, so this is where having some intuition with how the algorithm functions really matters. Observe in the worst case, variable, variable j begins begins at i minus 1, right? Because we assign j to be i minus 1 each iteration of the loop. But notice that in the worst case, it goes all the way to the left and it causes that, it causes the condition of this while loop to fail at some point right near the furthest left that it can go. So that means it goes down to zero. So just to be clear, that's when the j is greater or equal to zero condition fails, is when I get j to eventually get down to zero. You know, that's going to be when you have a last complete iteration of the while loop before it gets invalidated. So this, this implying, this implying the following. It implies that the number of times the loop iterates, implying the number of iterations of the while loop 
is, well, let's think about it. It starts at i minus one and it goes down to zero. Now, remember I gave you a couple of handy formulas for doing this. If you actually think about it very carefully, there's, there's something very interesting going on here. J starts off at I minus one, it goes down to and includes zero. So if I wanted to count up how many times that happens, notice it's very much like the second formula, the number two that I wrote up there. So if I wanted to derive that, notice that it's just, well, one way, I'll first I'll just write it down for you, is the upper value I currently have, I minus one, and it goes down to zero, that's the lower value, and I add one to it, which equals I. Or, here's a much more natural way for me to explain it to you. It starts off at i minus 1, and it goes down to 0, right? It goes down to 0. So, the question is, okay, so you know that when I go down to 0, that's one extra count than if I were to go from i minus 1 down to 1, right? So, notice that it's i minus 1 plus this extra iteration, which is i. So that's how I can figure out how many iterations of the while loop occur. It's because I know that it starts off as i minus 1 and it goes down to 0 in the last complete iteration of the while loop. So that's the while loop accounted for. Let's talk about the for loop now. The for loop is much easier. Furthermore, the for loop starts at i is equal to 1, so it's assigned and set to 1, and goes up to, it goes up to n minus 1, implying the worst case time complexity the worst case time complexity is the following. I'm going to write it on that board over there. We'll work through the analysis now. We're just about done here. So before we proceed, are there any questions about how I got the number of iterations of this while loop and the number of iterations of the for loop? Because those are probably the two hardest parts of this analysis. The rest is just us applying the closed forms. See, the great thing at least about the for loops is that it tells you, like it says, okay, I start at one and it goes up to and includes n minus one. So you know exactly how many times it has to happen. The while loop required us a little bit more intuition. Okay, so if we're okay with this, let's proceed. So now I'm gonna reformulate what I have right here in terms of the information I currently have. So remember, I know that the for loop happens how many times again? Well, it's gonna happen, well, it starts at one and it goes up to n minus one, so it happens n minus one times. But notice that for each iteration, I have all of this work that's happening inside the for loop. So I'm going to rewrite this as a sum. Because that seems a very natural thing to do. It's just because notice that i seems to play a very big role in the right, how many operations happen inside the while loop, right? So almost just like I'm executing the for loop, I'm going to use a sum that's going to represent the operations that happen for the for loop. But for each iteration, it's affected by what the value of i is. So I'm going to write this as a summation. Because then I can write out what i is in relation to this. So I have the sum from i is equal to 1 to n minus 1, just like my for loop. See, notice it's a 1, and I have n minus 1. Same idea. Notice that for each iteration of the for loop, I perform how many iterations of the while loop? i. Exactly i many iterations. And each one of those, the number of operations is c1. So it's c1 times i plus all the operations that are outside the while loop. And then outside of this sum, so this is, I have this whole sum here, 
plus C3. That's just my return statement. So this is just me formulating the exact same thing we had just over there. But now I have all the information I need to now determine a much more simpler form so I could spot at it and look at what the behavior of the function is. So we're going to see, is it a linear function? Is it going to be something else? We'll see. We'll see if we can affirm something you may have seen in 115. Uh, so, so notice that I can take this and one neat property that summations have is that when you have addition inside of a sum like this, you can split it into two sums. So a lot of these tricks, you'll find that actually, if you find yourself just unsure about a lot of these properties, actually I do have it in that same document I referred to earlier on in the lecture. If you find yourself wanting to look at that list of properties, I also give some tips on how to simplify these things down. I encourage you to work through those little examples I have there. You'll find it really helpful if you're playing around with this a little bit more. Um, but I can split, I can distribute on a, summa, on a sum like this with my summations. So I could go C1 times I. So I'm going to distribute over the two. So now I have C2. I is equal to 1 to N minus 1 plus C3 on the end. So now I have two sums and a constant. So here's where it gets fun. Notice that this is C1. I notice every time I'm just multiplying C1 by I each time. This is no different than if I could just pull out the C1 and I could have the exact same thing I had before. So I have C1 times the sum from I is equal to 1 to n minus 1 of I. Plus I could do the same thing with this one right here. C2 times the sum is i is equal to 1 to n minus 1 of 1. And I have C3 just sticking around over here. So here's the great part. I have these things in really nice form for me to use the closed form expressions, right? This is a, We know what this is. So I'm just going to plug it in. But I want you to notice that the upper limit of the summation is n minus 1. It's not n. So we have to be a bit careful here. So notice that the upper limit is n minus 1, so wherever there was n in our formula, i have replaced it with n minus 1. So I'm going to have c1 times whatever n was in our formula. So it's n minus 1 here, then I add 1 to it, which is just n divided by 2, plus, okay, c2 times, how many times did this happen? It's n minus 1 minus 1 plus 1. Minus 1 plus 1. This is the other closed form. In fact, you could have applied it just by looking at this directly and using it. But I just made it a little easier for you to see. And I have the C3 just sitting out over here. And I'm just going to rewrite it just slightly for us. So I'm going to write this 2 over here. And I'm going to expand this. I'm going to multiply this out. So I'm going to have C1 over 2 times n squared minus n plus C2 times n minus 1 plus C3. Question. Question. What kind of function is this? It's quadratic, exactly. So you can conclude that insertion sort takes quadratic time in the worst case. So this, this is a quadratic. Very good. Perfect. So you could say that insertion sort takes quadratic time in the worst case. So this is how you could, this is one way you can derive it. Now, one thing you could take a peek at in the notes, because I'm going to leave you here. The, um, I also show that you can also actually simplify this analysis technique even further. Because if you notice in our analysis, so like I said earlier, how you can isolate out the part that takes the most number of operations as opposed to every single one. Notice that inside this while loop, if I can count how many times the operations inside this loop occur, so I could just pick one of these lines and count how many times that happens, you'll notice that that actually seems to attribute the part that looks like a quadratic in this function here. So one thing you could also do is you can also just simply count the line that happens most often in here, which is one of these two lines, for example. And if you do that, you'll end up with a quadratic as well. So I'll let you take a look at that. It's in the same section in the notes after class.
So when we come back, I'm going to give you intuition around how we're going to put all these pieces together, how we're going to take the complexity of a given algorithm, and we're going to see how we can express this for all inputs and all possible implementations. And this will be bringing us to the idea of big O notation. So when we come back, we'll play around with big O notation. So I'm going to say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.